say a couple of things. First of all, Bill, I've heard a lot of good comments about the uh, newsletter that just came out. It was great. And it was good. Tyler, Tyler's here on Thursdays, and thank you for keeping the torch going. He kept us going that Thursday. We were here working. Um, also, wanted to mention that next month's presentation, this is a preview of coming attractions. It's over on the I've got one here. It's Harrison County, and Crawford and Harrison County Cavers and Their Caves by Gary Robertson. Now, get this, Gary Robertson was all excited about next week. He was going on a trip to Israel. I think not now, unfortunately. That's a sad situation. But it's been really fun talking to Gary about his experience with caves, with the cave over at Corden and, and Marengo Cave and, and others. Uh, if there's anything you want to know about caves, their history, or anything related to caves, come next month because it'll be fun to hear from him. Now, we go on a little bit of a break until March. And in March, we're going to hear from Karen Schwartz. And she's written a new book called The Journey Along the Blue River. So Karen is going to be here in March to talk about the book, The Blue River, and things we all remember about the Blue River. So I hope you come for that as well. That'll be good. Now, oh, and I wanted to tell you, say one other thing. Some people probably think, gee, John, why are you talking about pilgrims in October? Well, there's a reason for this madness. There's a reason we didn't wait till November. The pilgrims are an amazing story. And to tell you the truth, 30 million people are descendants from one of the pilgrims. And so we wanted to do this in October so that you had a little bit of extra time to not only think about the pilgrims, you may want to check and see, hey, am I connected with the pilgrim? And you may want to collect some stories to tell your kids and grandkids about why the pilgrims were such an ama amazing group, small group of people. I know what, I learned some things. But one of the things that I have enjoyed most about the Pilgrims is I have a neighbor, Mike Hassenstab, who is a, he is truly a Pilgrim expert. I'm going to tell you more about Mike a little bit later. Mike's going to be the last half of this presentation. But if there's anything you want to know about Pilgrims and how to connect to them, we have got the man here. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the Pilgrims here. Uh, let me go to presentation. Okay. We're going to talk about the pilgrims, who they were, share a few interesting stories, and for those of us who have ever cooked a Thanksgiving dinner, and I did once, I'm about as successful, but I did once, <laughs> but anyhow, the four women who cooked the first Thanksgiving meal and how to find out if you're a descendant. We're going to cover all those things tonight. This is a list of the pilgrims, the passengers, I should say, the passengers on the Mayflower. And as you can see, there's quite a few of them. And as I said earlier, there's 30 million descendants from that group of people. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The Mayflower was about 80 or 90 feet long. How long do you think this building is? 40 feet. Hmm? 40 feet. Think 40 feet? 60. 60? 60. Well, I don't know. I'm, re I'm really asking. So I just, <laughs> this is pretty much most of the length of the ship then, I guess. The Mayflower was an old wooden ship that actually they got part way into the Atlantic and the main mast cracked. And they, all, they talked about turning back, but eventually they sort of jury-rigged it and got it to go. But the Mayflower was not a big ship. It's not the cruise ship we think of today. 
And the, the passengers, they were in this section right here, below decks. Now, Sherry and I have been cruising. But this is a cruise I don't think we would necessarily wanted to go on. But it was quite an interesting ordeal that they went through. Who were the passengers on that, tri on that trip? Well, this is something that I learned. I usually think of the, past of the pilgrims as religious people that wanted to come to America because they wanted freedom of religion. And that is partially true. But what this shows is that 54 of the people, and there are 102 passengers, 54 were separatist Puritans. Those are sort of the people we think of as the pilgrims. But along with those 54 people going for religious freedom were 31 people called the strangers. How about that? The strangers. Who were the strangers? Well, they were just people that weren't of the religious group, but they were going because they wanted to, to live in a new part of this world. They were adventurers. They wanted to set up businesses or farms or to explore. There were also 14 indentured servants that went along with these people. Uh, there were five sailors that were contracted to be part of the crew but stay with the pilgrims for one year after landing to help them get through that first year. They all ended up staying. There were three that died across as they were crossing the Atlantic, and there were 30, about 30 people in the crew. There was also uh, a couple of babies born along the way. How would you like to have been a pregnant mother on that trip? It would have been an adventure. Well, it was an adventure because this shows some big waves. They started this trip in the wintertime. So they're going through the North Atlantic in the wintertime. And these Atlantic seas in the wintertime were really horrible. But I, would want to, I do want to share with you quickly a story because here is the thing about generations in history. The times may be different, but life experience is pretty much the same. If you were a parent of kids on the Mayflower, you would, rec you would sympathize with these parents. Let me tell you this story of the unexpected swim. The unexpected swim. During one of those brutal storms, when the Mayflower was forced to draw its sails and, and hull or just sit for days, one of the passengers apparently became desperate for fresh air. Bradford wrote that a lusty young man, his words, named John Howland, wandered, on, wandered onto the main deck, and when the deck pitched, he was thrown into the sea. By some miracle, Howland was able to grab hold of a rope hanging overboard. He held on for dear life, though, quote, though he was sundry fathoms under the water, wrote Bradford, working quickly, the crew snagged him, and pulled him back on board. He lived many years after that. He was a lucky guy. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> um, having a hard time seeing up here. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going through the North Atlantic, and oh, the other point I wanted to make was, well, what, what did they eat? Did they eat? How many of you have been on cruises? Several. Lots of things to eat, right? Well, the pilgrims had lots of things to eat. They had dried fish, salt pork, hardtack biscuits, and beer. Everybody drank beer because the water went bad, they said, so they drank beer, the young people and the older people. So they had a pretty, pretty uh, uninteresting diet. So you're getting a flavor of what was life like on the trip, life was like on the trip over. And they left Plymouth, England, and they were planning on going down to the Virginia colony. Actually, they were planning on getting to the area where New York is today because they'd been in the Netherlands for a while, and the Dutch thought that New Amsterdam was the place to be, and they were planning on going there. But this was a good example of 
if you plot a direction and you're just off a little bit over a lot of days and a lot of miles, it can make a big difference. Where did they end up? They ended up in Massachusetts. Their trip was over 3,200 miles. It took them 66 days. They arrived on November the 21st, 1620, and they were flying along at the speed of three miles an hour. But they made it. Now, <clears throat> I also want to share another. Uh, kids are always amazing, so I want to share one other example of parenting as a Mayflower passenger. Um, most passengers who sailed on the Mayflower in 1620 were religious dissenters who'd been living in exile in Holland before sailing to the New World, where they hoped to find peace and freedom from persecution. John Billington was loyal to the Church of England, uh, setting him apart from fellow passengers who referred to Billington and other servants and adventurers as the strangers. So he was sort of a different group than the rest of them. Billington made enemies on his harsh trip across the Atlantic, earning the reputation as a foul-mouthed miscreant. We probably use different words these days. Now his son Francis, here's where we get into teenagers, or always teenagers. His son Francis made squibs and shot his father's fowling piece, or his gun, near a barrel of gunpowder in the ship's hold, which, look, yeah, I can see why this would be fun. I think this would be fun. Uh, but anyhow, he's made, shooting, making a small fire that might have shunk, sunk the ship and resulted in the death of everybody, and the pilgrim story would be, be null and void. But by God's mercy, no harm was done. The older son, John, got lost in the woods for days and was returned to the college, colony by the Native Americans. As you can see, this was an, this was an interesting family with interesting uh, dynamics, right? So don't feel bad if you worry about it's hard to raise teenagers. Mm -hmm. It is. Now, so the last thing that I've got before I pass it on to Mike is, so they got there in November of 1620. Only half of them survived that first year. Um, and there were only four women left of the passenger, or passengers. By the next fall in Thanksgiving, when they had what we consider the first Thanksgiving feast. And what about that feast? Well, there were four women, a saint, a good wife, a traveler, and a troublemaker, and four teenage girls. And they got all, all involved in this. They had to feed 143 people. This was a big group because a lot of the Native Americans came to visit with them. What kind of tableware did they use? Ever thought about that? They used knives, spoons, trenchers, and tankers. Forks weren't a thing in those days. So, no forks. What kind of meat did they have? They had deer and duck and geese and swans, carrier pigeons, mussels, lobsters, fish, eels. And they had other food like cranberries, nuts, pompion, pumpkin, wild plums. But they did not have flour, sugar, and baking ovens. So there was no baking to do in that first, first uh, year. And so, in conclusion, I want to read to you one little story about this first Thanksgiving feast. Now, while the women cooked, the men entertained the guests. They showed off their military drills for the Indians, and they probably played a version of football on the beach with the natives using deerskin ball stuffed with deer hair. So it sounds like football. 
they would have eaten lobster and mussels and clams without butter because cows didn't arrive until later. Cod, bass, eels likely appeared on the tables. They probably also served native fruit. Cranberries, plums, melons, grapes, as well as walnuts, peach nuts, chestnuts. Pumpkin, called pompion, undoubtedly would have appeared on the menu. The early colonists ate lots of pumpkin. In fact, the first American folk, folk song is a lament about how much pumpkin they ate. They got tired of it. The women who cooked the first Thanksgiving certainly did not make pumpkin pie. There was no flour, sugar, or baking ovens. And they probably just stewed it. But at least they had football. <laughs> so that's the first Thanksgiving meal. No turkey. Wild turkeys. No turkey. You know, that wasn't listed there. But they had no one. There they must have been wild turkeys. They didn't have any pizza and what animal did they burn? I don't know. Oh, but they didn't have any cows. I bet they did have chickens and well, well, some pigs. More to research and a lot to learn. Okay, now. I want to welcome Mike Hessenstab here, my neighbor. And he went to school in Marengo and Milltown, amongst other places. And he is a pilgrim expert. And he is also a member of the Mayflower Society, which means he can literally prove how he's connected to a pilgrim. And I'm going to turn the time over to Mike for the rest of the presentation. Ancestry could be fun, mm -hmm. and uh, also you can learn a lot. About 25 years ago, I got started in Ancestry, and uh, built a tree, and every once in a while they had somebody on it, old John Harkins, brother-in-law, his family, and then they had a, they had a schoolmate, one of them was uh, Sandra Green, her twin sisters, Carl Green ran the store in town. Uh, after a few years, I started, all my ancestors started being people in town married to, to the Towers. Our family is out of John Tower. I wound up in Marengo uh, somewhere early 1800s. And it's Matthew Tower, 1768. So back in when he was a child, he went to church, the one church was in Covington, Massachusetts, and the Ford family lived there at that time, Joseph Ford and Freela B. Hall. So they all went to church together and his kids. The Fords went to New York, the towers came south. In 1816, for some unknown reason, I haven't figured it out yet for sure, all the Matthew Towers family, and Sarah had divorced and three children, wound up in Etan. Oh, we all went to church together with kids. Kids got to go on dates and stuff. Cotton married Hannah Edson in uh, 1816. Sarah, the mother, married Cotton's Constant Williams from Marengo in E-Town. Well, how he wound up in E-Town, I don't know. Or whether it was already in Marengo uh, after uh, Cotton and Hannah married. So Cotton's brother, Hull Tower, married Sarah Edson. Sarah Ford's daughter. And then the son, Daniel, married Rachel Needham, and she was from the E-Town area. And they all wound up in the Marengo for a while, out by Carefree. The Conrads, and then I just started marrying them, and that's how we wound up. So, Paul, his wife Sarah, Daniel, and Rachel went west. And evidently by wagon train. I think it even tells how many wagons. And they wound up in Illinois, Oregon, California. Uh, Hull and then stayed in uh, made, made California. And Daniel made it to Illinois, and I went up in that area. So over a period of time, this one young man sent me a message through Ancestry saying that he'd come to believe that we were cousins through John Tower from 1609. Him and 
uh, Samuel Lincoln came to the United States or to America uh, at the same time. Samuel Lincoln is the ancestor to Abraham Lincoln, so they were all buddies in Weymouth, Massachusetts. So the guy's name is uh, Stu Ward. He's now living in uh, Nova Scotia. And, uh, he sent me the message. He said, I'm out of Benjamin, and you're out of Samuel Tower. So we messaged back and forth. He said, I started you a wiki tree that similar to Ancestry, but it's free. You put all your Ancestry stuff into the wiki tree and start building. And the wiki tree people help you like I do. I, I try to help everybody I can because I didn't help. So that's how my wiki tree and all my links have passed. So, uh, So let me hand it back to Wiki Tree. So my Wiki Tree, I built it back and got all these people on it. And I come to find out, oh, we're all pilgrims. Because I come to find out he had to be list up under the yellow eyes. Y'all see that again? Take a picture of it. Save it to your photos so you can look at it. If you do a lot of ancestry, start in the bottom <coughs> right hand corner, take that pilgrim's name and see if he's on your on your ancestry. If you have to do gold circles, you say Mayflower descended, Mayflower births, uh, deeds, increasings. You've added all this stuff to the point of your ancestry, the possibility you're a more than likely. So, when after a while, <clears throat> I was frustrated building my wiki tree. It took me six months to get my first Mayflower passenger on there. So, I do it for a while and come back up. Oh, I've got to do these four grandparents, and I've got to do eight, and I've got to do 16, and then 32, and then I'm only uh, five generations. I'm not getting anywhere. So then finally, I decided after I looked that list over and found I had 65 or 69 of them on my ancestry tree. Somehow, <clears throat> linked by marriage or by ancestor, uh, I decided to take my wiki tree and go straight back to James Chilton. Bang, 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 bang. I got back to James Chilton, his wife, was one of my friends in Nova Scotia, the message says, Stu, I got my cover on there now. He said, no, the wife's wrong. Fix it. That's all I said, fix it. So I go back, I search, look around, study. Yep, it's wrong. Her, she's actually known as unknown Chilton, but they don't know for sure who she is, but she was on the boat because the daughter was there. We are out of the daughter. Married Chilton. So, Fixed it and sent it back to him. He said, okay, you're, you're done, you got it. So then, but then I learned how to do wiki tree tools. And then he showed me, he said, you do what I tell you. It'll, it'll, wiki tree will tell you how many pilgrims you got on your tree. So I did the thing, did the truck thing through the wiki tree. I had James Chilton, unknown Chilton, Mary Chilton, Francis Cook, and 65 cousins. By marriage. There's, six, there's 69 people on that yellow sheet on my tree. So there's also going to be a slide you're going to put up in a minute. This one? This one here. There you go. <laughs> I have come to believe that all these family names, somebody from that family is a pilgrim. These are proper county names, too. Yes. Yeah. Now, some of them. Some of them are here for you, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're either Ledworth, English, Marengo, Milton, Constant Williams, Sarah Ford's my tree, Constant Tower's my tree, Poe, who's my aunt Wanda Poe. She's a Poe that goes back to 1500 in Germany. And a descendant or an ancestor cousin to Edgar Allan Poe, Anthony Poe. Uh, Ralph Poe, school teacher, uh, little Anthony from the service station up there, uh, all of Aunt Wanda's family, uh, Bruce Pearson, his mother is Edith, uh, she's Poe, Connor, that's my grandmother, my grandmother's proven guilty, uh, made by descendant, that's my mother, my father, myself, and my wife. So I, all those are all the way 
Jake's children. So Judy and Carolyn and anybody else, all the children, all my children have to prove their marriages. And, uh, I'm not sure about what John might do his uh, parents. Glosson is my uh, great grandmother. It's Grandma Bridges' uh, mom. She was a barley, out of Peter Barley. He had uh, 21 children. And three wives and 21 children is buried in Carefree Cemetery down from world. There's like four generations of my family buried in <coughs> Rope Rock, Philo Rope Rock on World Tops Mill. He's a big fire pastor. He said, My name's Ashton Dad. Uh, Edson is uh, Sarah Ford Edson. She married Isaac Edson. He's a Mayflower descendant of the James Chilton, so that's where my children came from. And her, and <coughs> Ford, her mom and dad, and <coughs> Francis Cook. I have a lineage back from Francis Cook down to me, but I can't prove it because uh, Sarah I took her vital records and uh, Using it for his ancestor and proof, Francis Cook, and what's called Brick Wall. Miller, Helen Miller from uh, Milton, I'm going on the variety store. Her, she's a tower, a cotton tower. Needham, it's a, uh, I don't think there's a big very many Needhams around here, that might be. But her family's uh, probably from around the end of the car. E Town. Dillman, uh, Olive Dillman, uh, Garland uh, Green, on the watch store in Ringo, all those Dillmans are pillars. Because they have to be proven. I can show you how they are and give you the lineage, and then you just have to be proven. Claude Fancher, Harold Fancher, Margaret Morgan. I think she's uh, I don't think she's involved too. Gibbs, I, I think part of Gibbs wife is still. Hanger, I think I uh, there's a possibility that the hanger tree fell apart. Mm -hmm. And then you got Darwin Green, Harry, and Dillman. Gibson is my mom's first cousin, married dad, her first cousin. He's a Mayflower descendant. Dennis Marr. Dennis Marr married and my grandma Dot's daughter. He didn't make virus then. So all their children out of Dennis and out of uh, Joyce, Joyce will be uh, make our fashion Flanagan, Anita Flanagan uh, married uh, Robert Batten. Robert Batten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Flanagan's are on Mayflower. I just, I've already had proven it before, but I'm getting more information about their lineage. Washburn. I'm not sure about all oh, those Washburns. Yeah, the, the Washburns, accepting the Crawfords, the Coleman's, Kurtz East, Purcell, Rainford, get down to uh, Fredonia, Alton. Leavenworth, that's Sherry's connections, and so if you have any questions about some of those names, you can get with Sherry and I, and we can tell you more. And I have, I have Sherry and John, so mm -hmm. okay. but uh, I'm going to try to send out all, all these little wiki tree things from the lineage so they can go in the folder. I, I thought I sent them to you, but I, did you? You did, it? and there'll be a folder here Tuesday of this Pilgrim information. All, all these yeah. screenshots. Yep. Yeah. You want to talk about the tools here? Yeah. Okay, there's all kinds of uh, different tools that you can use to search your ancestry. WikiTree is free, Family Search is free. Mm -hmm. John and I are collaborating a lot. We met by accident one day. I took a parquet. He was standing out in the field about ring world off in the neighborhood. And then next thing you know, we talk about ancestry and fame, you know. There you go. So then I did history and I did cherries and ran cherries out. Mm -hmm. With WikiTree, you can, the tools for WikiTree <coughs> take 
Sherry's Week 3 ID, and the ID from her pilgrim, to do the little. Did you put all the practical sign pictures up there yet? What picture? The picture of uh, Sherry's lineage. Uh, yeah, it was, it was the beginning. Okay. It'll be with the packet. So, in the meantime, I needed to, to do something with Dad's uh, finder grade. So I joined finder grade and went in and took a picture down and somebody put a hem on there instead of his grade marker. According to Mayflower Society, the second source is the person's finder grade that has their marker on it and all the dates, birth date, death date. So I thought, well, by chance I might need it, I, I might need it. Uh, once you determine that you possibly got everything you need for to do a Mayflower application, you want to get into that now? Yeah, yeah, that would be the last one. Um, <coughs> Also, when you do, when you get into the families or the finder graves, there'll be pictures. There'll be a name up there. If your finder grave's been handled by, say, John Combs, little well, John, uh, Sarah Combs' son, he's big. Him and uh, Sharon Morris from Livermore. Uh, they, well, Sharon's got a lot of a lot of history, but. There's names on there, and there's people put little flowers, like call them flowers or memorials, and they'll put their little ID on there. You click on their ID, and you can send them a message. I got a list that's so long because I got. A, I'll ask somebody, "What do you know about Sarah Ford? What do you know about Sarah Ford? What do you know about you know, so and so on the street?" Because I might be searching the Poe or Conrad or Gilman or whoever, and you usually get answers back. And you find you get a lot of information off of from family or from the finder grade. Family search, they're a different ancestry site. And John is he does mainly family search and that's how I got on what I do. I started a family search tree. And once you get enough tree established and get it back to the paper passenger and you do the link. There's your pet, you've got three people, or three sites that you uh, link your tree to. Mm -hmm. So when I do family search, I go up and do and ask who, who my trailblazers are. It says Francis Cook, James Chilton, Mary Chilton, this is unknown Chilton. And then I'll list, start listing the presidents. It's it's a, you know, so it's just another source that ex expands what you do all that. Facebook groups. I'm probably in about 30. I've been in different ones for uh, Fuller, Hopkins, Chilton, Cook, uh, DNAs, uh, Eastern DNAs, uh, the Tower Group, the Wiki Tree Group, uh, and I post on a lot of them. And, uh, matter of fact, I probably had, I think I had three mergers yesterday. Because over a period of time, I duplicated my wiki trees, and people run across and say, "Okay, we've got two James Chilton, got mine and another person, and they're the same. We need to merge them together." So then, her and I are the managers of that wiki tree profile now. And, uh, like I did one for uh, uh, follow uh, growth crop. Hey, Mike, could you take a minute to tell people what the Mayflower Society is and why they might want okay. to join? So, after a period of time, uh, I didn't have the tools I have now. I can go back to her tree and pretty much through Family Search because they have a database that says Sonoma Winter, or, uh, Sonoma Winter. Mm -hmm. her father is a Mayflower descendant. So, when you Plug it in and go, Joseph. Uh, we put his name in there and search it. 
-hmm. the pop up says he's been proven three times. Mm -hmm. So you already know her tree is down to Sonoma's father. Sonoma doesn't have any records, so she's at what's called a brick wall, so she's not going anywhere. So after a period of time, I had all this information and he gathered all my stuff. I decided to do what's called a uh, Mayflower Society match. So I set the seventy-five dollars off and my list with my pilgrim, my pilgrim line. After a couple of months, I got a message back saying that they found an application that had eight generations proven. So I got all the way down to Sarah Ford and Isaac Edson and Hannah is the daughter and she wasn't proven. Nobody's ever proven her. She's mine. So they told me I had to prove from Hannah through myself and my wife's marriages, my births. So then I started digging for the documents and then I contacted the Indiana State Historian that there's a list in Mayflower Society handout or on the internet. And ours is listed in under Indiana and you contact them. And then she did a worksheet with my lineage and it came from Daniel and his brother. He was proven. So all of the ancestry from Daniel through his mom all the way to James Shelton was proven. So I just needed to pan it. They're in Old Tower like, on the other side of the Carefree. And then Samuel, the son, Maggie, his daughter, Grandma Brady, Mom and Dad, and four generations in one cemetery, the other one down the road at half mile. So I needed all the documents, birth, deaths, and marriages for each each generation. And it takes three copies. I took folders, like three dividers, and put each generation in. And then I've got it all ready. Uh, just bundle up your two copies of each document. I put a cover sheet between each generation. And you have to send your fees in with the uh, fees and pleasure. So I sent the documents in, and then she typed up the application for me to sign, sent it back to me with instructions to sign it, date it. Two checks, one for the society for the dues, and one for the Indiana Historical Society. I did get about two hundred fifteen dollars, but it took three months for Plymouth, Massachusetts, to run all the my documents through. And as a matter of fact, I have a friend that's a Mayflower Society historian in Washington State that had the application sent it to me a long time before I even was approved. And then later on, he sent me all the notes that were in the file for the, that application. All the back and forth between all the historians trying to prove all my documents. Like 17 pages that I have that. So I have contacts with Atlanta, I have contacts with Washington State, Make Our Society. I have uh, hives in the wikitree.com uh, that are cousin. Uh, by marriage, not, not mostly probably by a main bar. Some of them by not the high I have a lot of cousins there. I have a cousin in uh, Sweden, New York, California. Uh, but the Glossom family, it was my cousin. Before he passed away, he passed on a folder to me, probably at a family reunion and didn't tell me what it was. And I set it aside and didn't even look at it. He passed away about six months ago. I seen that folder laying out. I go, let's see that folder. I opened it up. It was all his notes. He had a page on there that there were 16 wagons left North Carolina for Oregon. Then when it got to Crawford County, so-and-so decided to stay and that was uh, John Clawson, very great grandfather, who married Gilly uh, Barlow. And his brother, Ira, 
took his family by wagon train and wound up in California. I've got a cousin up there, her name's uh, Joanna Hardy. She, she's up in Ira Fawson. Hey, go ahead. Yes. Would this be a good time to stop? And would you be available to answer questions afterwards? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. As long as my brother will let me. Okay. I'm going to rise tonight. Okay. Uh, well, as you can tell, Mike is a real expert when it comes to the Mayflowers and genealogy work in general. And he's been a great help to me. So I'm sure that Mike can help you too. So if you have any questions, please be sure and ask Mike afterwards or get in touch. And it was Mike's idea to put together this folder. Actually, I think we'll put it into a binder. All this information here and a bit of the other information uh, so that if you want to come back and see what was covered here, it'll be available. So, Mike, thanks for coming tonight. Appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed learning about the pilgrims. They were a fun time.